and welcome to Digest This, where we focus on day-to-day -day clinical issues in gastroenterology. My name is Julia Gauci and I'm a gastro trainee in Edinburgh. Today we are going to be discussing new developments in IBD surgery and I'm delighted to welcome Ms. Nicola Henderson, a consultant colorectal surgeon in Dundee. Welcome Ms. Henderson. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us today. So I think it's fair to say that over the past decade or so, the face of IBD management has changed drastically with the um, development of novel medical therapies. How would you say that IBD management has evolved over this period of time? Well, it's been really interesting over the last 20 years. We've seen a huge change in how we manage our patients because of biologics. So we've been using biologics in UC in, of course, less time than we have with Crohn's disease, but we've already seen a big shift in the number of colectomies that we're doing. For example, we know from our data in Scotland that the colectomy rate has decreased quite significantly and there's a paper published recently looking at biologic use and colectomy rate in Lothian and we've seen how much this has changed. So it's gone from around 1.44 colectomies per 100 patients with UC to 0.44 colectomies. It's really interesting to see how that's impacted on our service. And we also see fewer colectomies that need to be done right now for UC. In the past, we'd often have to do um, major surgery in the middle of the night because patients had become so unwell and we don't see cases like that anymore. In Crohn's disease, biologics have of course made a big impact, but also interestingly, we're seeing patients coming to surgery rather than going on biologics in Crohn's disease. As our medical therapies get better, our IBD patients are living longer and longer, and as a result accumulating more comorbidities. How has this affected surgical decision making? Well, that's really interesting, um, because age per se is not a barrier to surgery. And the things that we're really interested in are not just how old they are. So in my cancer practice, I'm operating on people into their 10th decade, even and people who are 90. And in, what we're more interested in now is whether or not the patients have frailty. And we know that patients who have an operation who are frail, we can make them more frail just by virtue of doing an operation. So that is something we need to consider. But age is not such a barrier for us. We're more interested in the whole patient and what they're like in general rather than just how old they are. So that, that's something that we were very worried about probably prior to the introduction of laparoscopic surgery more. So when patients were having to have a laparotomy, which is a huge insult, it's difficult to recover from, that would have been a bigger insult to a frail patient than a laparoscopic operation. And we now have level one evidence, we have guidelines, all of us, um, I think as first line now, would offer laparoscopic surgery to patients who are having a surgery for IBD. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned laparoscopic surgery actually. I think more and more patients are really keen to go down the minimally invasive route. Um, what would you say are the specific challenges to this in IBD? So in IBD patients, particularly with Crohn's disease, you always have to keep in mind that this might not be the only visit into the abdomen. So there are some challenges associated with that due uh, think things like herniation so patients who have repeated midline laparotomies are more, more at risk of herniation so often when you choose port sites and when you consider extraction sites you've got a mind to the future that somebody might need to use this wound again and the patient might need to have further surgery if they've got Crohn's so that's one of the things that we think about when we're placing our laparoscopic port sites the other things that we would consider with laparoscopic patients is um, whether or not we want to do something like an intracorporeal anastomosis. So in patients who have obesity, sometimes can be challenging to get stomas up to the skin surface. It can be difficult to bring bits of intestine out in order to create pouches or to um, you know, resect bits of small bowel, etc. So you may want to do some of that work intracorporeally and laparoscopic surgery gives you the capability to do that. Okay. And I think another area which patients are really interested in is robotic surgery, which is becoming the kind of new buzzword. Do you see that becoming routine for our IBD patients? So I'm about halfway through my career um, in terms of how far I've come and how far I've got left. And I think it's very unlikely that we'll be doing routine IBD surgery with a robot within my career. And that's because of funding and because it's so expensive. 
it's going to be really challenging to use robot surgery in patients with IBD because the cancer service is where the benefit is the most. So the advantages of the robot are that you have um, makes difficult things easy. So things like intracorporeal suturing, things like um, creating an anastomosis, you know, creating pouches, etc., is all much easier with the robot. But those advantages are greater in patients who are having cancer operations, particularly in the male pelvis. It's where we see the real benefits. There are different types of robots, and some robots it's more challenging to switch and do multi-quadrant operating. It's set up specifically to operate in one area of the abdomen. So with the huge cost involved, the amount of time to train surgeons involved is probably going to preclude it being routine within the next 20 years. There's really interesting data coming out of the States where obviously their funding system is very different and they are using robots in their elective colorectal practice. They're even using it in their acute colorectal practice. But I think it's going to be a wee while before we see this happening routinely for um, IBD patients. And patients should be reassured actually that laparoscopy gives them many of the advantages that the robot gives and it's still a person doing the operation. It's not that the robot does the surgery, it's a, it's a surgeon guiding the robot. The advantages, the advantages that we get are to do with um, no tremor, no, uh, you don't get fatigued, you have much more range of movement. Instead of using two straight instruments within a confined space, we have articulating instruments and some of the, the arms all have energy as opposed to us having to change instruments and ringing in hooks, etc. So it's quicker, it's better, but perhaps the advantages are not quite there yet to warrant investing in it for all IBD patients. Are there any more cost-effective uh, advances then, changes in surgical technique that have improved outcomes for patients? So there's a lot of interest in different techniques in improving outcomes and we have seen, for example, great success with ERAS protocols with patients who return to um, stool eating and drinking, mobilising much quicker following their operations than we did in the past. So ERAS is a cheap and easy way to improve outcomes. Also surgical technique, things such as the cone OS anastomosis, there's a lot of interest in this different way of constructing our join after we've removed a bit of bowel, when we join the two ends back together. Most of us tend to do either a side-to-side -side or an end-to-end -end anastomosis in the UK, but there is some interest in the cone OS anastomosis, and a recent randomised control trial from Italy has shown really impressive results with the cone OS, where instead of joining just the two ends of bowel back together, um, we create a supporting column of tissue underneath our anastomosis, which is created in a beautiful, wide, easy to negotiate with an endoscope manner. And I suppose it's, it's little changes like this that make the experience of the patient much nicer and much easier because in order to get through that with an, an endoscope, it can be uncomfortable for patients, it can be challenging for them. So I think if we can do these little things that improve outcomes for patients and also seem to improve the recurrence rate, we know that the cone OS anastomosis tends to be associated with much less anastomotic recurrence than the traditional ways of joining the bill back together. The guidelines for, for us as surgeons from our Association of Coloproctology remain that there doesn't appear to be any huge benefit to the cone OS anastomosis, but this RCT has been published after that guidelines come out, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the next set of guidelines from our governing body, whether or not there is going to be a recommendation on this anastomosis technique. And looking at the most current guidelines, which aspects of surgical management have the ro most robust evidence to support our practice? So the guidelines are really interesting actually, and to go through them you appreciate just how much of it is level 4 evidence. And there's nothing wrong with level 4 evidence, it's absolutely acceptable and we do lots of things that we don't have evidence for. Um, but the level 1 evidence that we have is around using the laparoscope as a first line treatment for patients and not performing a laparotomy. Smoking cessation in Crohn's disease, that's really important for me as a surgeon. If we can get patients early in their, their Crohn's disease journey and get them to engage with smoking cessation and ask them to consider giving up smoking. There's good level 1 and level 2 evidence for DVT prophylaxis um, around a creation of a J pouch as opposed to a W pouch. 
but the vast majority of our guidelines are based on expert consensus. And that's also true with the European guidelines, which were published around the same time. It was 2018, 2020 that these papers were published to guide us. And the 2020 uh, paper published by ECHO uh, focused heavily on the interdisciplinary spirit as mm -hmm. part of IBD management. What's your opinion on the role of the surgeon in the MDT and how has this changed over time? So I think that the colorectal surgeon is a, a crucial member of the IBD MDT and I have seen a huge change during my working life from when we didn't have an IBD MDT to having regular well-chosen patients at our IBD MDT. It's really important that we're involved and that we have this concept of it being our patient and not my patient or your patient, but that we have a shared care model and we learn from each other. The MDT system is fantastic, it reduces variability, it creates better decisions for patients and I think that having a surgeon involved at an early stage with patients is really key to having a good IBD MDT and having a shared practice and clinicians who have a, a real interest in IBD as opposed to um, those who perhaps just do it as part of a varied job plan. So as part of improving our teamwork between the medical and surgical teams, what recent changes would you want the gastroenterologists to know about to improve our working relationship and deliver better quality care? I think it's really important that we have a surgery first approach for patients who might benefit from that and that patients are given a range of choices. There, without a doubt, is a there was previously just equipoise, but I think now we have really good evidence that shows that surgery first in terminal ileal Crohn's disease is an excellent treatment option for patients. And the Lyric trial, which was a, a randomised trial multi-centre in the UK and in the Netherlands, had a fantastic results. They looked at around 140 patients who were randomised either to infliximab or to surgery for treatment of their Crohn's disease. And they published their paper um, in 2018 and then they published a follow-up paper a couple of years later showing their long-term results and it's the long-term results that are actually the most interesting. The original paper was looking at quality of life comparing surgery to infliximab and showed um, using the IBD quality of life questionnaire that they had equivalent qualities of life and it wasn't powered to do anything other than show the same quality of life as opposed to are things better but their follow-up data is fascinating because of those patients who had surgery first none of them have had any further surgery and only 26 percent of them are now on anti-tnf treatment of the patients who had infliximab in the original trial group half of them have gone on to have an operation and the rest of them have had escalation of their anti-tnf therapy and I think that's really exciting and interesting for patients who are living with a disease that's likely to be lifelong. Um, to let them make informed decisions about what's best for them, um, it's important that all that information is presented. And I think that's difficult to do in a short clinic appointment with a gastroenterologist. It's probably best done in a shared clinic with dedicated long slots with a consultant surgeon, consultant gastroenterologist, trainees, colorectal specialist nurses, stoma therapist experts. So as you can have a really good informed conversation with that patient and let them make the decision that's right for them using the best available evidence and advice. It's really interesting that they used quality of life as an endpoint, which is something we've only started to see recently. Do you think that how our treatment goalposts have shifted over time? Um, yeah, I think it's fascinating how um, treatment goalposts have shifted and the, the different ways in which we measure success. And a lot of that has come about because of patient involvement in research. And there's been some really interesting studies in colorectal surgery looking at patients as partners with us, as chief investigators in studies, looking at outcomes following parastomal hernia repair, for example, um, looking at pregnancy in patients with stomas. There have been some very high profile studies that have been done in partnership with patients. And I think that's a fascinating switch in the, what matters to the patient rather than what matters to the doctor. I Absolutely. think it's a really nice way of conducting research. Absolutely. And where do you think the future lies for surgical management in IBD? So, 
The future developments that I'm excited about and really want to see an improvement in in the next 10 or 20 years is in the approach to perianal fistula because for me as a surgeon it's something I really struggle with and try Despite how hard I try, I can't seem to get these things to heal. And that's a real difficulty. Um, and it's frustrating because even the best, most novel treatments, for example, the stem cells that we can use in Crohn's fistulas, they still have healing rates of around 64% which is pretty depressing. If I was offering you an operation to fix your bowel cancer and the success rate was 64%, you probably wouldn't want me to do that operation. So we need to find something to do for anal fistula, not just in Crohn's disease, but all fistulas. I think there's a lot of interest and excitement in robotic surgery and the improvements that will make. I suspect we're probably having to wait a bit longer to see that impact in IBD. I think it's exciting to work with patients and to see how can we improve our research questions by involving patients as partners in that. Um, and I think it's probably going to be interesting to see what happens in the next 20 years or so with regards to um, differences in endoscopy and the different ways in which you'll treat cancers um, that for just now I remove and do a cancer operation, but I think that'll probably shift and we'll have more um, minimal access techniques, more endoscopic techniques to remove early cancers. Okay, thank you very much. That was a fascinating discussion. Um, all that's left is for me to thank you for being here today and to thank you at home for watching another episode of Digest This.